I'm Michael Tamlin, CEO of the global ebook store Rakuten Kobo. We have a regular procession of authors who visit the Kobo offices. While they're here, I get a chance to learn a bit about their careers, creative process, and their reading and writing lives. And hopefully, you will too. Welcome to Kobo in Conversation. I'm Michael Tamblin, CEO of Rakuten Kobo. My guest today is Karen M. McManus. Karen is the New York Times bestselling author of the YA thriller One of Us is Lying. And before you say, hey, I'm not a young adult, I'm out of here, you should give this a listen. First of all, I'm fascinated by the craft that goes into captivating younger readers, especially when they have so many other things they can be captivated by. Second, she's a fascinating person. Third, I brought a ringer to the interview this week. Rather than just ask questions that a not-so-young adult would ask when reading a young adult novel, I went directly to the intended reader and asked Madeline, self-identified YA novel specialist, to give the book a read as well and bring her questions. Hi. (laughs) So, really, you get two interviews for one, which makes this absolutely worth your time. As with each of our guests, we ask her to tell us about books from three times in her life. The book that had the biggest influence on her in childhood, the book that was most formative for her as a writer, and the books that were central to her most recent writing. And along the way, we'll be asking about her own latest book, Two Can Keep a Secret. Karen, welcome to Cobo and Conversation. Thanks so much for having me. Let's start at the beginning. Was there a book that really defined your childhood as a reader? Yeah, you know, it's always tricky to pick just one. I was a huge, voracious reader. I read a lot. But one that has stuck with me is the book A Little Princess. And I think what I loved about that was not just that there was lots of drama. You know, She was an orphan. Terrible things happened to her. She was at this awful school. But she got through it using her imagination. She created this fantasy world for herself and her friends. And to 10-year-old me, that was very powerful, that you could get through anything just through imagining a better life for yourself. So I'm going to ask a follow-up to that. As a young adult, was there a book that spoke to you between the ages of like 12 and 16? Oh, that's a good question. When I was a young adult, the category was not as robust as it is today. So there weren't as many books specifically for young adults. I actually read a lot of Stephen King at that age, which was quite formative to me. Um, I think it's part of the reason why now I gravitate towards writing books that are not on the horror side, but are definitely a little bit on the darker side. Did you know then that writing was something you wanted to do? Yes and no. I started writing when I was about eight years old, and I did think at that time, at the wise age of eight, that I would become an author. That was what I wanted to be. And I kept writing right about till high school. And at that point, I kind of gave up. I thought that it was hard to finish, and nobody I knew in real life thought it was a real job. And so I didn't keep going with it until many years later, but the desire was always there. Now you're a parent. You've been a marketer. Was there a particular event that made you decide, now's the time to come back to it, I'm going to trust my eight-year-old self and become a writer again? (laughs) It was reading The Hunger Games. That was the most formative book for me as a writer because it was the first time in a really long time that I was completely captivated by a book, and not just the book, but the voice. And it occurred to me that that was my voice or that I could do that voice. I could do that young adult voice. I sort of understood it and it really appealed to me. So for the first time in a long time, I sat down and tried to write a book. I wrote a very bad Hunger Games fan fiction book, which went nowhere, but it got me back into the love of writing and made me keep going. And how did that lead to your first published book, One of Us is Lying? And why did you decide to write for young adults? Yeah, I think partly it was because I was so inspired by Hunger Games. And then I started reading more in the genre. And I was just struck by, first of all, how much it has evolved since I was a young adult and how many exciting and diverse and boundary pushing and interesting books are being created. And I wanted to be a part of that. And I also just felt that the young adult mindset of figuring out who you are, of kind of looking at the world um, as you're shaping your own worldview is something that really appealed to me. So I'm 16. <laughs> you're 
obviously a little older than I am. A little bit. But <laughs> I would have trouble writing as an adult. So how do you keep the voice of teen narrators authentic? Yeah. So I live in a, a pretty close-knit neighborhood, urban neighborhood, and there are lots of teens and tweens that I know well. Um, you know, I have a son who is now 12, but when I started writing, he was about eight or nine. And so he had lots of babysitters who I would hang out with and talk to and listen to, you know, and make sure that I understood what they cared about, what they talked about, what kind of technology they used. And I would occasionally bounce ideas off of them. In fact, for One of Us is Lying, I said to them, I'm thinking of this book with a gossip website. And they were like, oh, did your book take place in 2007? <laughs> so it became an app. <laughs> Got it. So let's talk about your new book, Two Can Keep a Secret. We have twins Ellery and Ezra moving from across the country to the small town of Echo Ridge, uh, a town full, really full of murder and secrets. <laughs> yeah, very dark little town. And so at the beginning of the book, dealing with lost luggage is a top priority, but then is quickly followed by figuring out who has killed whom. But it was uh, one thing that struck me was it was also filled with a cross section of challenges that are faced by kids and families in America. You have the opioid crisis, you have families with addiction, you have divorced and blended families, cliques of gossip, kids moving homes, single moms. Were you consciously thinking about what contemporary challenges you wanted to put in front of your characters and explore? Yeah, I, I've done tried to do that with both of my books um, because, of course, you want to tell the story and you hope to tell a good mystery. And you, but I think for people to engage with the characters, they have to be relatable and they have to be going through things that you know a lot of kids have gone through, or they know someone who's gone through, um, or it's something that they've read about. Or it's somewhat current, so I do try to create these opportunities for the reader to engage and have empathy with the characters. So Ellery, one of the main characters, is a true crime fan, and you brought up Stephen King as well. Yeah. Do you yourself have an interest in true crime, or does the story draw any inspiration from actual true crime stories? It doesn't draw inspiration from actual true crime stories crime stories, although I have been told since the book was published that other people have heard of similar cases. But I am I am interested in true crime. I follow the My Favorite Murder podcast and some other podcasts like that. So I do have an interest. And I think, like a lot of people, it, it comes from, you know, not, I think, a ghoulish interest, but in this... Um, you know, some sort of anxiety of all the things that can happen to to people who are just going about their business and trying to sort of manage some of that fear and anxiety that you feel and come up with a way to feel some sense of resolution and, and even, you know, some hope and growth at the end of that for others. So Ellery's brother Ezra creates some queer representation in the book, which is fantastic. How do you make sure to give Ezra an authentic voice as well? Do you have any connections to the LGBTQ community yourself? Because I, as like a young member of the community, was just wondering. I do. I do. I have a lot of close friends my age who are gay or bisexual. And then I know some younger, again, you know, members of my of my neighborhood community that I, you know, kind of listen to and draw from and also just, you know, sort of see them living their lives like an Ezra does or a Mia does. And I try to bring that in. I'm fascinated by this interaction between you and the teens in your community. Are they? Do they know you now as that person who's going to come and ask me questions <laughs> <laughs> about the book that she's, she's working write stuff on? About yeah, me. yeah. Um, yeah. Now they actually volunteer quite often. You know, do you need to talk to me about anything for your right. book? And I will always take them up on that. So your the people in your community, as especially the teenagers, are any of the characters in either of the books inspired by anyone? No. No. I really try not to base characters on real people. In another interview you describe your first book, One of Us is Lying, as Breakfast Club with Murder, which I would absolutely go to see. Uh, <laughs> what, what books or movies were you reading or watching as you were getting ready to write Who Can Keep a Secret? So there are a couple of TV shows that just sort of the mood of them I was I really liked and, and I drew inspiration from. And one was Twin Peaks, which that just whole sort of mysterious vibe. And this is the unluckiest town ever. And you never know what anyone's really thinking. And another one was Scream, which, um, again, you know, not the horror aspect of it, but just that whole, wow, this town is really pretty and terrible things keep happening here. So those were a couple of places that um, inspired the setting somewhat. 
Now, there was a theory that there might have been a couple of other shows that you were watching while you were writing this that Madeline and I were talking about. Was Pretty Little Liars a part of the mix? Always an inspiration of mine. It's one of my absolute favorite shows. I love it. I That was a big inspiration for One of Us is Lying also. Yeah, the odd thing is actually with The Breakfast Club as murder, that's exactly how I described it to a bunch of people. So which character in Two Can Keep a Secret were you most drawn to when giving them a voice? Was there one specifically who you were really excited to write for? Yeah, I was um, really excited to write Ezra, actually. Ezra probably shares the most characteristics in common with me. You know, he's not a main character. He's sort of along for the ride in a lot of ways, which is kind of how the writer feels, you know, that you're observing a lot of this. But he also has this quiet passion for the things that he cares about. He's very musically inclined. He's very supportive of his sibling. I'm extremely close to my sister as well. So he was a character that I felt like I didn't get enough time with him. Um, And a lot of people have asked me, will we see an Ezra book someday? And I don't have a definite answer for that. But I also wouldn't rule it out because I would like to spend more time in his head. Your story is set in motion by a series of deaths spanning years. In your mind, are those victims characters that we haven't met? Or are they devices? Are they sort of parts of the scenery that the story is set against? How fully realized are they in your mind? To me, they're very fully realized, you know, and I tried to get that across in a couple places because one of the things when you're writing a book like this, you have to write it respectfully, you know, and and I do think you have to treat the victims as people. And Ellery, as a true crime aficionado, at one point she's visiting the scene of the crime and her brother says, do you want to see where it happened? And it sort of strikes her that well, I just met some of these people and this is this is very real now and um, I, I think I need a moment before I do something like that. And, and so at that point, these people who we don't get to meet become very real to her and that becomes a real driving force and why she keeps asking questions when nobody wants to talk to her. In a world where it seems like everything is conspiring to keep people, especially young people, distracted on their phones, doing anything other than reading... Does that change your job as a writer? Or do you think about the hurdle of keeping attention differently? Yeah, I do. I mean, I have a 12-year-old who keeping his attention is really tough, so I see it every day. And when I write, I try to do a couple of things. I'm a fan of short chapters myself when I read. Um, I'm also a fan of cliffhangers at the end of a chapter. And I'm a, I'm a fan of multi-POV because I feel with that, you know, you can get bring someone along with one character and they get really invested and then you flip. And they're like, okay, I, I want to see what this character is doing, but I also want to get back to this character. So that's a way of keeping people engaged. I think all of those are pretty applicable to the young audience right now. I mean, I definitely agree with you in all those. I read my first different multiple POV book this summer and I thought it was like really, really interesting. And then reading this one, I was so excited to see it again because you get so much more depth in all of your characters. And I think with having the difference of Ellery and Malcolm, it brings so much more to the story. And real contrasts between characters and their points of view and how they're relating to the story. I heard that One of Us is Lying is being adapted for television. Yes. Tell me about that experience. Yeah, it's it's been fantastic. Um, it's been optioned by Universal Cable Productions. And so, you know, it's in development, which means there's not a lot I can talk about right now. Mm-hmm. But it's been a great experience, a really collaborative team, a lot of dedication to maintaining the integrity of the book, which I really appreciate, you know, with the understanding, of course, that with a series, you have room to expand. So a lot of thoughtful discussions about, you know, where else can we take this beyond what's on the page. So I've really enjoyed it. In continuation to that, especially about the show, I was just wondering personally, as you know, the audience of YA readers currently, it's much smaller than I think it used to be just because we have more of a technical generation. Do you think that you're going to get more attention from the audience as a TV show than it is as a book? Definitely. There's really no substitute for television when it comes to generating awareness. So it would open up the book to a whole new readership, which would be great. Last question. First book, One of Us is Lying. Second book, Two Can Keep a Secret. I know where this is going. <laughs> we as booksellers love series here at Kobo. Do, do I sense a pattern here? <laughs> You know, you do sense a pattern, but I am sorry to tell you we are breaking the pattern for the third book. (laughs) I can't tell you what the title is yet, but it's not going to be three (laughs) da-da-da-da-da. Got it. Thank you, Madeline, for your young adult 
YA novel expertise. <laughs> thank you. Yes. And thank you so much, Karen, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. That was a lot of fun. That's it for this episode of Kobo in Conversation, a podcast about books and the authors who write them. To discover the books you just heard about or to follow us, please visit www.kobo.com slash conversation. This podcast is produced at the Kobo Audiobook Studios here in Liberty Village in Toronto, Ontario, Canada.